Hi, good morning. It is Friday, March 27th, and I have so much to talk to you about, so many ideas. So this format is really working better for me than I thought it was going to, and the problem is, is I'm making like 15 minute videos every day of top quality content, if I may say so myself, just so focused and so orderly, but um, I think and also making annoying noises in the background. And I have tea. Morning. A little bit of Earl Grey. Is it a booktube video if you don't have a set piece of some kind of hot beverage? That's what I want to know. So let's jump into today's content and then we'll see. Editing Alexandra in the future will make decisions. That's fine. So again, still reading the uh, Arthurian Romances by Cretien de Troy. I am now in the fourth story which is called The Night with the Lion. It is the story of Yvain. And according to one of the footnotes in this book, um, or end notes, I should say, Yvain is apparently one of the only knights in the sort of cast of the round table that is connected to an actual historical figure. There's a lot of like thoughts about whether or not King Arthur, <laughs> that's my husband blowing his nose. There are a lot of thoughts about whether or not King Arthur is a historical figure himself, um, and there's it's dubious, possibly, but they are pretty sure that Yvain is, per, is a real person, and in fact, even in the stories where he shows up, it's referenced that his father is this is this king, I forgot his name, and I'm not going to look it up, because that'll take too long, um, who we know actually was a king in a region of France. So this story starts off with a tale of Yvain being defeated by a knight and having to recoup his honor. In a sense, he's been shamed. And part of that is he goes to this sort of like mystical, magical location with a tree of life. This, this symbolic idea that comes up over and over in stories, um, especially European stories. So I want to read you this passage because I just love the magic of it. So he's telling the story of the first time that he encountered this, this spot. He says, I left the peasant as soon as he had shown me the way. It was probably the hour of tears and might have been near midday when I saw the tree and the spring. I know for a fact that the tree was the most beautiful pine that ever grew upon the earth. I don't believe it could ever rain so hard that a single drop could penetrate it. Rather, it would all drip off. From the tree I saw the basin hanging made of the purest gold that was ever sold at any fair. As for the spring, you can be assured that it was boiling like hot water. The stone was of emerald hollowed out like a cask, and it sat upon four rubies brighter and redder than the morning sun when it first appears in the east. Everything, I say, is the truth so far as I know it. I was eager to see the miracle of the storm and tempest, but this was unwise on my part, and had I been able, I would immediately have retracted my action after sprinkling the hollow stone with the water from the basin. But I poured too much, I fear, because then I saw the heavens so rent apart that lightning blinded my eyes from more than 14 directions, and all the clouds pell-mell dropped rain, snow, and hail. The storm was so terrible and severe that a hundred times I feared I'd be killed by lightning that struck about me or by the trees that were split apart. You can be sure that I was very frightened until the storm died down. So this is like this magical place. There's this evergreen, beautiful pine tree that's growing up, the most beautiful tree in the world. And under it is running this magical stream that even though it's cold, the water is boiling and roiling and, you know, bubbling up. And you're, there's like a gold pail and you take this pail and fill it with water and then you throw it onto this emerald sort of bowl or receptacle that's there at the foot of the tree. And that causes this miraculous storm to happen. So I want to kind of focus on this idea of this magical tree, this tree of life. We see it show up, for example, in Norse mythology under the name of Yggdrasil, but it's in a lot of mythologies, this idea that this sort of symbolic represent representation of Gaia or Mother Earth, this fecund and fertile life-giving tree as emblematic of the cosmos. And here it's depicted as an evergreen or as a pine tree, which is evergreen, which is also symbolic, particularly in like medieval European stuff. That's where we get, you know, the green giant type of myths and jolly green giant. That's why we have Christmas trees at Christmas time. It's this scent. It's this symbol of eternal life, the symbol of that, that 
you know, even in the deepest of winters, we're going to have the renewal of strength. Spring, it's going to come back around. And then, of course, we have the stream flowing underneath it. And here we have this idea of the well of life or the water of life as well. So these two ideas are really combined and synchronized with each other. And here I want to really compare it to the Garden of Eden, because obviously we have the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. And even in Eden, it's depicted as having a stream flowing beneath it. And it's referenced again in Revelation, this tree of life being in sort of like this heavenly symbolic image with this water running underneath it. Now in Eden, we also have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I think it's sort of interesting. A lot of people kind of gloss over this without really making it clear. These are two different trees. These are two different symbolic trees that exist in this myth or this creation story that we see at the beginning of, of Genesis, right? And I, I don't see in a lot of other mythologies, the dual trees. And I think it's really important because we actually have you know, two different symbolisms, two different symbolic systems being represented. One is sort of hierarchy, masculine, logic, judgment, this order, orderly system of good and evil. And then the other is, you know, obviously the Gaia symbol, the tree of eternal life, this idea of fecundity and fertility that we've already been talking about. And I also find it really, really interesting in the story that's in Genesis that when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that's really worth investigating, this idea that there's a, a synchronized and entangled system of good and evil that is something other than what they have encountered with the holy God. But we can talk about that, you know, some other time. But then we, that they are disbarred from having access to this tree of eternal life. Like, that's actually what you know, the angel with the flaming sword is guarding them from having access to anymore. And even this idea of the walled garden, which was what we see that Eden is, is a symbol that comes up over and over again in medieval stories. It came up in Eric and Anid, the final battle and the final like sort of adventure and challenge that Eric had to face was going into this walled garden where there was this very powerful warrior and nobody has ever defeated him or come back. And that was called like the joy of the world, I think, even, or something like that. So it's like symbolic of this huge bringing back this idea of the Eden-like experience to the people. And then we even have it in, again, in Cliché, I think I read my fruit step before, they have this walled garden where their love is able to be experienced and is able to be pure. And once the outside world kind of breaks in, then you know, it ruins the love that Cliché and his, his lady love have, whose name I've already forgotten, because it was like two days ago. And, and again, even there we have this sense of this tree of life that's sort of like protecting them in, in its bowers and guarding them, guarding their love. So anyway, deep, rich symbolism. I love it. So the final thing that I wanted to talk about, which I haven't mentioned at all, is that I actually finished an audiobook this week as well. It was the audiobook called Essentialism, and this was a nonfiction work that kind of deals with almost like the philosophy of, of minimalism and how to implement it in your life in the sense of like focusing on the essentials. And this book was, I don't know, something that I really needed to listen to. For me personally, I do pursue a life of minimalism. This is probably the most decorated corner in my house that I film in front of. But the rest of my house is really quite plain and blank. Uh, I have keep like a small wardrobe. I don't own a lot of possessions. I do own a lot of possessions, <laughs> if you think of it in the world scale, but compared to the average American, I would say. But one of the things that I have a really hard time with is minimalizing my mental life. There are so many things that I'm curious about, that I want to try, that I'm interested in, that I have a really hard time focusing. And I think that even comes through in the way that I deal with my YouTube channel because I have periods where I'm like really into it and I film a lot and then I have periods where I don't because I'm interested in other things. And overall, I'm fine with that. I'm really kind of fine with like chasing the wind, following, you know, my impulses, I guess, with my hobbies and with my free time. But I think this book could put into strong relief for me, how important it was for me to actually be more selective about how and where I spend my time. Because even though, you know, literature is not my job, it is in fact probably what I'm best at. And if I were to really focus on it and become even better at it and use all of my time on 
reading and putting in out content like this because this even like sharpens my skills to be able to talk about it that I think you know I will be using my time better than kind of going here and there and trying some other things so I'm actually going to try to implement some of the ideas that I learned from that book um, here and I think the effect will be hopefully seen on my YouTube channel where I talk about literature so anyway that is what I have read since my last update and actually the audiobook was all week so throughout the week and hopefully you guys enjoyed this discussion i would love to know what you think of this sort of tree of eternal life or this life tree kind of symbol where else do you see it in literature it is just man i think i've talked about it before it comes up in the aeneid it comes up in poetry it's just this symbol becomes extraordinarily important in you know, Western literature and European and English literature just to modern times. So it's really, really worth being familiar, familiar with that symbol so that you can, you know, incorporate it into your papers and your analysis and that sort of thing when you see it popping up elsewhere. All right, so that will be it for this week. Until next time, my name is Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile.